Right, if you'll open up your Bibles to Galatians 5, again, it's, uh, we have covered the fruit of the Spirit, but as you see up, on, up here, the, we're going to focus on that last phrase where it says, against such there is no law, but when you get to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, would you please stand, we'll honor the reading of God's Word. We can all read it together. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you again Look thankful and blessed. And Lord, I, I just want to praise you this morning for the songs we've sang this morning thus far, Lord, the, the prayers, the children's sermon that we just heard. Lord, I pray that, that they, they touch everyone who hears it. And Lord, I just pray this morning as we go over this part of your word, this part of your scripture, Lord, that, that you are glorified, you are praised, and Lord, that hearts are convicted. Lord, that, that, we, that we are affected by what your word says about us and says about what you've done for us. And Lord, I just pray that you use me as a... a just, just a vessel, Lord, that, that you'd be glorified and, and that your, your word, your greatness, your gospel be proclaimed this morning. Lord, it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so hopefully this morning, as we've spent quite a few weeks talking about the fruit of the Spirit, okay, we've went through every one of them individually. And I pray that as we went through those that you maybe have felt some conviction and thought, you know what, I need to show that more in my life. If I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, that, that needs to be evident. The love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That, that we looked at those and said, I need to show that more in my life. And so hopefully, uh, I, I pray that during that course of time, every one of us has been convicted in some shape, form, or fashion because I can tell you, Myself, neither nor you, show those fruits perfectly. And it's just the way it is. And, and I pray that you've been convicted and, and seen some things that, that you can work on, some things that you can do better. But this morning, as we are kind of moving on from the fruit, and we're fixing to really talk, we've already talked about walking in the Spirit, and we're going to talk about it some more in the next couple of weeks. But I pray this morning that... Uh, Yes, that there's some conviction that happens. I mean, because any sermon, any teaching of God's Word that we hear, I feel that there needs to be some conviction. Something needs to prick us in the hearts. You know, because that's what Hebrews 4.12 says about the Word of God, that it's a two-edged sword, that it's sharp and it cuts down to us. It cuts down to the root of who we are. And, but I, I pray this morning, too, that, that we look at this and we see the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, that we, that we see some things. Why, why maybe we should be motivated to show fruit? You know, as we have this new year coming, why we should be motivated to serve God like we've never served Him before? So we, we've got to this point by talking about walking in the Spirit. Going back to verse 18 here in Galatians 5, it says, But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. And so then we see what the law applies to, these things in verses 19 through 21. All these sins, that every one of us has had some of these sins in our life. We, we went through these, not individually, but we talked about them, you know, a, we took a couple Sundays to talk about them and how that, uh, on the surface we may think that these don't apply to us. You know, adultery, fornication, and we see, we see in the Bible that Jesus says, if you lust, you've committed those. Then idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. It goes on to envies and murders. And we see those things. We're not immune to having these sins in our life. You know, the, the main examples that we see a lot of times are the adultery because of what Jesus said about lusting in your heart. Or the murders about when Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you have committed murder. You know, that's just not your siblings. Okay, I know there's times that my kids don't like each other very well. And they make it known. But when they truly hate somebody, that means they've committed murder. And, and, and maybe 
maybe that the fact that Jesus said that and what He meant by that gets diminished in our culture, in our worldly culture a lot of times. Because we think, you know, well, that's a major sin. That's, what's, that's what people go to death row for, and I've not done that. When Jesus has said, if you hate your brother, you've committed these sins. And, and those sins, these transgressions, these sins, that's what the purpose of the law was. Back in Galatians 3, 19, it says, Wherefore then serveth the law, it was added because of transgressions. The law was added. God gave it to Moses because of the sins that were not just in Israel, it was, that was in the world. Okay, Israel was not immune to it. They, they wasn't special in that sense that they didn't sin. That's why God gave them the law. If we look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8 and 9, it says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers. And it goes on and lists some, some more sins that, that are in a lot of people's life. So, but it's saying the law, if used right, and we go back to some of Paul's other, other writings, the law, if used right, points us and points out our sin. That it shows us in our life where we have dishonored God, where we dishonored ourselves, where we've dishonored our neighbor. That, and that's what the purpose of the law was. But it says it was not made for righteous people. And what is the definition of a righteous person? It is the person who's been blood-bought, who's born again, whose sins are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus' righteousness has been given to us. That has been imputed. That's the word it uses to us. <coughs> and so it's saying that those that produce those spiritual fruit that we've been talking about, that are born again, that have Jesus, have the Holy Spirit living inside their heart, that there is no law spiritually condemning them. It's saying that that law does not apply to us because we are covered by Jesus. You know, when we're born again, there is no law that if we break, that we'll be condemned to hell. There, there's, there's no spiritual law condemning us when we're born again. Romans 8, 1. And we ought to, we ought to take, take pleasure in reading this. We ought to take comfort in reading this where it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So it's saying those that are in Christ Jesus, those that are born again, those that are saved, that there is no condemnation for them. You know, that's one of those verses that's, that's used to teach eternal security. Or once saved, always saved. Now, I know there's some here that may not believe that. May not go along with that. But Paul writes that if you're in Christ Jesus, if you're walking in the Spirit and not living in the flesh, there is no condemnation for you. Now, We've all committed the sins that are listed in the Bible. You know, some there may be some that we personally have not committed, but we all have sinned. You know, those that are saved and born again here, there was a time where you was not saved or born again. There was a time where you was lost. And so, but through grace and mercy, Jesus Christ endured the punishment that was ours, that we deserved. And our sins are covered by His blood. Romans chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. <coughs> saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Paul is quoting Psalm 32 here. Verses 1 and 2. Uh, almost, almost verbatim. He's quoting him and he's saying he's thankful because he's been forgiven that the sin that he had of ordering the death of Uriah because of his adultery with Bathsheba <coughs> excuse me those sins are covered that, and they're not imputed to him they're not charged to his account he's been forgiven we see in Psalm 51 after Nathan has come to him and pointed out his sin 
that he begs for forgiveness. Let me go there and just read you a little bit of it. We, we should know it. Or I say not know it, but be familiar with it. <coughs> Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to thy multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Watch me thoroughly from my sin for my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin for I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me against thee thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest here is David and we see repentance in that psalm we see somebody that's sorry we see somebody that, that agrees with what God has said about them says you are a sinner Okay, David was the king of all Israel. Okay, and he had an empire that, that nobody in Israel has, has come close to with the exception of Solomon. And, and the things that he ruled, the things that he was able to accomplish. We look at him and here he is. He, he's probably on his knees. He's begging God for forgiveness because he knows that God has said, You are a sinner. You are wrong. You have sinned. You have committed murder. You have committed adultery. But when we look at Psalm 32, he's showing his for, that he's been forgiven. He's showing that he's praising God for forgiveness. That, his, that sin is not charged to him anymore because it's covered by the blood of Christ. And so our sin is covered by the blood of Christ. Any bad thing that we've done in the past. Now, I've always said that there's no sin greater than any other. You know, Jesus said himself that the only unpardonable sin is the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit. And if David can find redemption from what he did, a murderer and adulterer, and a lot of times we list those as the top sins. You kill somebody, boy, you've really messed up. You commit adultery, you've really messed up. But those are sins that David was forgiven of, that he found redemption from, that Jesus Christ, he can cover those sins in our life. And we all have that opportunity, and it would do us well to remember where we've been and where God has taken us. That, that's why I'm pretty honest and straightforward with a lot of people on my past. Okay, and I, I, I make no apologies for that. I regret a lot of things that I've done in my past. But I feel that especially the younger people can learn that... You know, certain sins don't damn you to hell because Jesus Christ can forgive them. We're damned to hell when we're born because we're born sinners. But yet Jesus Christ offers that forgiveness no matter what sin we commit, no matter what we've done in our life. And I'm, and I'm not talking just about the adultery and the murder, but the, the hate that we have in our hearts. Maybe the, the anger that we have, or the, maybe the way we treat some people, the way we act about certain things. There's a lot of sins in our life that Jesus Christ died for every one of them. And that's why it does us well to remember who we used to be. Who, who Jesus Christ changed us from. Who, who that person was that when we're saved and baptized, that we, we are showing that that person is no longer. That that person is dead and we are new in Jesus Christ. You know, because I, I see I've seen a lot of Christians that try to hide everything about their sinful past. And I, I, don't, I don't think that behooves us to do that. Do you think Peter hid the fact that he denied Jesus Christ at one point and wept and cried when he realized that he had done his Lord and Savior wrong? His best friend who he traveled three years with? Paul didn't hide his sin. We see him three times in the book of Acts tell his story on the road to Damascus. And we see in a lot of his letters he talks about who he used to be. And praise God that he delivered him from that. We, we see in 1 Corinthians 6, he's talking about all these sins. That, that uh, the, the people, if they commit these sins, will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. And Paul says, such were some of you. Okay, you were adulterers, you were murderers, you were liars, you were thieves, you were homosexual, whatever it was. Some of you were these. This is what you was named by. This is, what, this is what people knew you by. It wasn't your name. It wasn't who you followed. But it was the acts, the sinful acts that you committed. And, and Jesus brought you out of it. That you've been forgiven of that. 
And so when we are born again and, and indwelled with the Holy Spirit and we're producing that fruit, the law can't condemn us. That's what Paul writes. But we're not condemned by that law, but what we're doing is fulfilling another law. We're going to talk about it in a few weeks, but Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. It says when we bear one another's burdens, and you've got to remember, when I'm talking about the fruit of the Spirit, that's not just for our benefit. That is for the people's benefit around us. Okay, these works of the flesh, that's, for our, that, that's always for our enjoyment, our fulfillment. Now, it's never permanent, but when we look at the fruit of the Spirit... The love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, gentleness, all that, that. That's projected outward from us to other people. And Galatians 6, 2 says, When we bear another's burdens, we fulfill the law of Christ. James chapter 2, verse 8 says, If you fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. So, if we fulfill the royal law, that's saying when we fulfill the royal law according to Scripture, that's loving your neighbor as yourself. James is saying, you do well to do that. Okay, this is James, the Lord's brother. This is Jesus' brother. He said, you love your neighbor as yourself. You're fulfilling Scripture. You're fulfilling the royal law. You're doing good. You know, when, when Jesus talked to the one man and, and He asked him, you know, what's the greatest commandments? He said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus told him, He said, you're not far from the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, you're on the right path. You're close. Now, he probably could have went on to say, but who do you say that I am? That's all, you, that's, all, that's all you need. You love the Lord. You love your neighbor. Who do you say Jesus Christ is? And this is Jesus talking to him. Who do you say I am? And he asked that question to many different people. In Romans 8, 4, we read 8 1 earlier. It says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. So the righteousness of the law, the holiness of the law, that it would be fulfilled in us when we walk in the Spirit. Okay, in, in a few verses down the road, or, or the a couple verses down the road in Galatians 5, it says, If we live in the Spirit, let us walk in the Spirit. Walking in the Spirit can be hard. All right? We've got a lot of different things leading us a lot of different directions. And we, we, we have our work, we have our family, we have our children, we have the needs of the people around us. They pull us in all different directions. But we also have the Holy Spirit talking to us. And a lot of times, we put those commands, those, those uh, inklings maybe that we have, the, the convictions that we have by the Holy Spirit, the, the way that the Holy Spirit would have us to go. A lot of times, we put those behind everything else. He may lead us to pray for somebody. And you might say, well, I, I'm getting ready for work. I ain't got time. You know, we, 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 we push the Holy Spirit out a lot. But he says, those that walk in the Spirit, we're fulfilling the law of Jesus Christ. That when we walk in the Spirit and we show the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law that can condemn those acts. There's some laws here on earth that may keep us from acting out with the fruit of the Spirit at times. And, and, and it's going to get worse as the days go by. But there is no spiritual law that will condemn us when we are walking in the Spirit. That's what Paul says here. And so we have, we have this opportunity. And, and that, that's what I was hoping is the good news this morning. We look, at, we look at our life, and we look at who we are, who we used to be, Whatever the case may be, we look at that and we realize what it means when we look at the cross. What it means when we say that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And we have this opportunity that we can be the Christians God has called us to be. 
You know, God has made us in His own image. And, and as we are discipled, as we go through this life, we become closer and closer to His image. And, and us being in God's image, that affects everything around us. You know, if, if, a, if a whole family is made up of Christians who are living in God's image, then that's a family that's in God's image. If a whole church is full of people that are concerned with living the life like Jesus Christ, being disciples and followers of Him, then that church becomes followers, a whole follower of Jesus Christ. Not just one or two here or there, but the whole church. So we have the opportunity to be the Christians that God has called us to be, the body of believers that He has called us to be, the church He has called us to be, thus fulfilling the law of Christ. And that means a whole lot. That's a whole lot of things that we can do or we will do. You know, loving God, loving our neighbor, bearing each other's burdens, lowering ourselves, you know, not putting ourselves first before everybody else. You know, because Paul writes about that quite a bit, that going back to 6-2, bear one another's burdens. In other, in other epistles, he's saying, put other people higher than yourself. You know, we, we, could, we can learn what John the Baptist said in John 3.30. I must decrease, he must increase. You know, that's something... We had Bible school that had these bracelets. You know, it's been three years, I guess, at least. And we had these bracelets that says, John 3.30, and it says, I must. Hey, and you can bet, I have to be reminded regularly that it's not about me, it's not about what I want. It's never about what I want unless I want what God wants. That we must decrease and Jesus Christ must increase in our lives, in our ministry, in our churches. That we serve Him and we serve others. That we put what He wants, His will, above our own. You know, so a lot of times people look at New Year's as, as a time for revival, a time for renewal. You know, we sung Revive Us Again this morning. You know, and, and this, is, this is a great time, but what better motivation for revival than to see what God has done for us through Jesus Christ? You know, like Melinda was talking about, we forget about Christmas the week after. She said they've already got Valentine's Day stuff in the store. You know, that's the commercialism of it all. But I was thinking about this earlier. You know, why can't we celebrate the birth of Jesus year-round? Because here's the thing. The birth of Jesus is part of Jesus' life. He came, He left heaven. Okay, this is God leaving heaven to come and live as we live. To, to, and He couldn't come to a more lowly family. He couldn't be born into a more lowly situation. And then 33 years later, He dies on a cross for our sins. And then three days after that, He walks out of the tomb. You know, the whole scope of Jesus' life, I think it would behoove us to celebrate it year-round. You know, it, it might be good if, if, we have a, if we leave our little nativity sets up all year, but we also have the cross. We also have an empty tomb there to represent Him walking out of the grave. You know, the whole of Jesus' life. Because we've got to have every bit of it. We got to have a virgin birth. We got to have a, a God incarnate coming to live as us and then dying our death that we deserve, that we are owed. And then Him walking out of a tomb. And then Him coming back again. Every bit of that needs to shape and mold our lives. And so going into this new year, what better motivation than we have than that? You know, we, should, we shouldn't have, to be honest, we shouldn't have to have revivals all the time. You know, because you see churches, they'll have a revival whatever month they have it, and the next week it's the same old song and dance. Nothing has changed. They may, be, they may talk about, boy, that preacher, he really brought it. But, I, and it's been my experience, from me preaching at revivals to me hearing revivals, a lot of times... The preacher that comes in and preaches a revival, he doesn't preach anything any different than what the preacher that's there every Sunday preaches. It's just another voice. I remember when I preached a revival last year in Kentucky, uh, 
the, for a good friend of mine, he, I, I asked him, I said, well, how do, you, how do you think people are responding? And it's something along that line. So he said, you know, he said, what you're preaching? He said, it ain't nothing that I hadn't already covered. I said, that's good. You know, this, this shouldn't be new stuff. But we, we have the opportunity to let that affect us. Different every Sunday. Because you think about it. The gospel message in some, some shape, form, or fashion is preached every Sunday. And if we respond to the gospel message the right way, that we let what God says about us affect us, that we let it change us, we, we let it drive us, we should have spiritual revival every day. As we wake up from our slumber, our sleep, and we wake up, we're revived. You know, we've got this, we've got a new day, we've got a new opportunity to serve Jesus Christ, to glorify Jesus Christ, to tell somebody about Jesus Christ, to let people know how He has changed us. There's going to be a lot of us, many of us, make New Year's resolutions, and they're going to be broke by the first day. Whether it be to lose weight, whether it be you read your Bible more, whatever. They're broken every year because we can't keep them. But what we need to do, we, we need to, to get grounded and realize what Jesus Christ has done for us. We, we need no other motivation than to be spiritually removed every day. Re renewed, not removed. But, you know, Lamentations 3 says, Thy, thy mercies are new every day. It's, it's by God's mercy that we even woke up this morning. Because it's cold. Some people may have just stayed in the bed and covered up. But it's by God's mercy that we have this new day every day. It's by God's mercy we can get up and we can say, we're a child of God. We're born again. We're saved. Jesus Christ has covered our sins. So that There is no law that can condemn us to hell. Praise God, I'm saved. You know, there's a... There's a church that, that I, I, I won't say I admire, but I like to hear their preaching. And I like to be around the people that are in it. You know, it's, and they, a lot of times, they'll have somebody shout out, say, it's good to be saved. And it is. And, and we should not have any problems shouting that. We shouldn't have any problems proclaiming that message, that we are saved, and by golly, I love it. I enjoy it. Jesus Christ has died for me, has took my death, and I'm born again simply because of what He did for me. And all I did was say thank you. So this morning, as we give the invitation, as Cleet and Cheryl come up, you, you can come up here and pray. You can, if, if, you've, if you've backslid, you need to rededicate yourself. If you need to be born again, or if you need to just... Take the time to make a promise to God. Say, God, I'm going to do something different this year. I'm going to do more. I'm going to tell you one of, the, one of my memories that I have, and I think I've mentioned this before and she didn't remember it, but uh, one New Year's Day, this is back when we left the church unlocked all the time, my mother brought me and my sister up here. And of course, this was when we had the, the paneling and stuff up here, all that was open was these front steps right here. And we come up here, and as a kid, I was, I was like, what are we doing? But my mother prayed and cried that she was going to be a better Christian, a better mom. And that has forever stayed with me. And we have an opportunity every day to say, God, you deserve better from me. You deserve more from me. As a human being, as a Christ follower, as a father, as a mother, as a brother, as a sister, you deserve, you are owed so much more than what I've given you. Every one of us can say that every day. He deserves so much more than what we have given Him. But that doesn't mean that we stop and we say, well, we can't do it, we're going to quit trying. That we are 
with the help of the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ leading us, that we draw closer and nearer to Him every day so that we can do the work that He has called us to do in every aspect of our life. Let's stand and sing.